Well, it sounds like Robert Caraballo was a criminal scoundrel from top to bottom, but do his alleged crimes justify the brutal murder of a man and the burning, the desecration of his body? Prosecutors say his wife, daughter, and a friend committed the murder, and then they moved on for the next 20 years until somebody's conscience demanded justice. Let's dig into the case of the the jack-in-the-box. Hey, welcome to Profiling Evil, and thanks so much for joining us. Please hit that like and subscribe button down below, and make sure that you're ringing the bell so that you're getting all of our notifications when we release new videos. And would you mind sharing Profiling Evil with your friends? And I wanna just make a special announcement. If you're considering attending CrimeCon, that's in Nashville this year, make sure you check out the special discount offer code I put in down below. You're gonna get a special discount on the registration fee and we're gonna have a chance to meet face to face while we're there in Nashville. Now let's jump in and talk about the murder trial of Michigan versus Beverly McCollum. It's now underway. It just got underway this week, and prosecutors came out of the gates swinging. Now you might remember McCollum being arrested in Rome, Italy a couple of years ago after police discovered a murder warrant on an Interpol watch list. She was hoping to get citizenship in Italy and just stay there. I suspect has something to do with this case. Well, she sat in a Roman prison for a long time until she was extradited to the United States to face charges. She's now charged with murdering her husband on or about May 7th in 2002. I mean, that's 22 years ago. And for the last two decades, this accused killer has gotten away with the crime. Now, if you're looking for a new case to go down the rabbit hole on, I think this one's for you because it has got some interesting twists and turns, including the arrest and conviction of her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend. You see, McCullen's daughter's already been convicted for the murder. The boyfriend's already been convicted for the murder. His name is Christopher McMillan, and his name came through the victim's son having a memory. And that memory led investigators to dig and dig deeper until they found his name. McMillan was smart enough when law enforcement approached him to turn state's evidence and to testify against the other two people. Good strategy if you're a criminal. Now, I spoke on Court TV today about this with Julie Grant, and I think it's a great reminder to anybody out there who might be thinking about being a party to a crime. If you do, consider going to the police and cutting a deal and helping solve a crime. Frankly, chances are you're going to be convicted anyway at some point, and you may as well look like you have a conscience. <laughs> so, let's watch this. See? The the jack-in-the-box murder case. Maybe you've heard of this case being referred to as such because of Robert Caraballo's body being found in that metal box in that blueberry patch in western Michigan. This case is really something. We have a great guest watching remotely with us to give us some uh, analysis, excuse me, from the law enforcement analyst perspective. He's a retired police commander. He also hosts a great podcast. It's called Profiling Evil. Commander Mike King is with us. Commander, good to see you. It's Hi, been Julie. a while. Good to see you. Oh, yes. Thanks for coming you on get today. get up too early. Oh, I know. I understand. <laughs> You're out west. I, I get it. I will not hold that against you, my friend. Because there are other witnesses there whose stories are going to matter for this jury. Like we saw, first witness out of the gate, her co-defendant, Mr. McMillan, uh, coming in with his prescription sunglasses and uh, telling the story. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, do you think that his story is something this jury can uh, align their common sense with? Yeah, and I think sometimes people worry about that. Well, this is a convict or this is somebody, but but what does this person have to gain by saying, hey, here's here is someone else? It's not going to change the 
conviction that he has, it's not going to change the amount of time that he's got. He was smart enough to make a deal early on, and hopefully it's a good reminder to other people that are involved in crimes, just come forward and work with law enforcement, because you're going to get a better deal, and you're going to get caught eventually anyway. Isn't that the truth, Commander? Commander Mike King, uh, you're so right about that. Uh, stand by, if you would, kindly, please, for more questions. We have to hit our first break. Well, the murder of Robert Caraballo happened at his home, located at 334 Horatio Street in Charlotte, Michigan. It's a quiet little area. Christopher McMillan, the guy who's already been convicted in the murder of Caraballo, uh, struck a plea deal. Uh, that required his testimony against Beverly and her daughter, who he says orchestrated the murder plot. Now, McMillan's serving a 15 to 40 year sentence after he pleaded guilty to the second degree murder charges he was facing and the conspiracy to commit murder back in 2019. On the first day of trial, McMillan testified that Beverly McCullum shared her plan to kill her husband, Robert Caraballo, nearly a week before the crime actually occurred instructing McMillan that the job he had in this murder plot was to wait at the bottom of the stairs where she planned on pushing her husband down the stairs. When he hit the bottom, McMillan was supposed to swing that bat and crush this guy's head. Now, Beverly instructed him that she was going to push him down, that she would strike him in the head, but that her daughter would be there to back him up and place a plastic bag over this man's head to suffocate him and ensure that he was finished off. I think they hoped they could knock him out and then suffocate him without having a struggle. Now, their plan included the idea that if he wasn't dying fast enough, they'd tie a rope around his neck, and that way they could close off his breathing faster. Well, things didn't go like they fantasized, and like they planned. And frankly, rarely do they do, do so. In fact, this is why we see disorganization happen in these crime scenes. Beverly McCollum's motivation for this murder, according to McMillan, was that she and two children living in the home were physically, mentally, and sexually abused by Caraballo. Now, if that's true, and she really wanted to stop this alleged abuse... Why didn't she just leave him or toss him out of the house? But, but instead, according to media reports, she marries the guy a week before she murders him. This just doesn't fit the storyline. And it's a really important point because it takes this out of the realm of a crime of passion. I'm upset because I just learned he abused my kids to a premeditated act where she talks through it, works it out. And I find it very interesting that Beverly and the victim, again, were just married a few days before this murder occurred. I'm hoping that we're going to learn more about this in the trial because a suspected reason or motivation for a murder might be an insurance policy or something. But this guy was never reported uh, as deceased, and he was only reported as going to Canada to sell drugs. In fact, that's the story that she pitched for his children who were too young to challenge this concept. So rather than be a responsible parent, in her words, Robert Caraballa just simply fled to Canada. I'd really like to know what you're thinking about this particular idea, especially given the fact that they were just married and then a week later, no more than a week according to reports, the murder occurs. I also kind of find it odd that the victim's extended family didn't report him missing to police over those 17 plus years. They had to wonder, why didn't this guy ever show up? Why didn't he ever contact his kids? And I'd also like to know if he was employed at the time he disappeared and if they ever inquired where he was. But instead, Robert Caraballo simply disappears, just like the roughly 105 plus thousand people who disappear in the United States every single year, never to be heard of again. Well, during the opening statements in the murder trial against Beverly McCullum, 
Eaton County Prosecutor Douglas Lloyd laid out the state's case around what they believe happened to Robert Caraballo on that fateful day. He told the jury that just like they had planned and prepared for, all three of the killers were waiting inside the McCollum house for Robert Caraballo to return home. When he did, McMillan and McCullen's daughter got into position at the bottom of the stairs. And I want you to visualize this. The victim was a creature of habit. They knew he would just immediately head down the stairs, and he did so. He started toward the steps and started to walk down the steps, just like he'd done so many times before. Well, Beverly McCullum, according to prosecutors, came up behind him and gave him a hefty enough push to send him tumbling head over heels down the stairs. When he landed at the bottom, he was dazed and confused. And that's where McMillan steps in. He stepped up to the plate with his baseball bat and he took a mighty swing, aiming at Caraballo's head. But instead of striking the man's head, the bat struck one of the banister posts near the bottom of the stairwell. And it shattered it into pieces. Now, McCullum's daughter was waiting at the bottom of the stairs also, and she was holding on to a hammer. Well, the moment McCullum missed his swing at bat, she jumped on top of Caraballo and started hitting him in the head with the hammer. All the while, Beverly McCullum was descending the stairs to help out. Now, I want to just say up front, I hope that I've got the defendant's name and the victim's name correct when I'm saying it. I've heard it a couple of ways, so I'm doing the best I can here, folks. But I hope somebody out there will clarify it if it needs to be clarified. But when Beverly McCullum got to the bottom of the steps, she grabbed the hammer from her daughter's hands and struck Caraballo several more times in the head. In fact... Her final swing was so forceful that the head of that hammer perforated this man's skull on the left-hand side, and the hammer became lodged inside of his head and in the brain. Now, concerned that this victim was not dying fast enough, somebody in this pack of killers grabbed a plastic bag that they had brought along with them, and they put it over the top of the guy's head. And another one tied a rope around his neck just to kind of make sure. Now, McMillan testified that he watched as Caraballo grasped for air and took his final breath. Well, once Caraballo was dead, the trio went into Beverly's bedroom and retrieved a footlocker that she had at the bottom of the foot of her bed. Now, they reportedly carried the trunk downstairs and there... They stuffed this bloody and battered Robert Caraballo's body into it, hauled him back up the stairs and out into, I think it was McMillan's white van. After they loaded the victim into the van, the trio went and got Caraballo's young and unsuspecting children, got them out of bed and put them in the van, where they drove nearly an hour north of their home from Charlotte, to a little blueberry field way up in the northwest corner of Ottawa County. And and as they got into that area, they used a seldom used dirt path. They call it a twin, uh, twin road path, I think, to an area that they felt safe in disposing the body. Now, along the way, they stopped and filled the van with gas, and they also filled a gas can that they brought along with fuel, again, showing their predisposition. And using that gas can and that gas that they purchased, they covered Robert Caraballo and the footlocker in gasoline, putting it on the side of the road and then lighting it on fire. Convinced that they had destroyed the evidence, which also included that baseball bat and the hammer, they got in the van and drove away. Well, the next day, Beverly McCollum told her stepchildren that their father had given up on the family and left the area to go north, over the border into Canada, where he planned on selling drugs. These were just little children, 
and they accepted the horrible news that they were given. Approximately two days after Robert Caraballo was murdered and then set on fire, that blueberry farm where he was left, the farmer discovered his charred remains on the side of that little trail and reported the discovery to police. For more than a decade, the body that later would become known as Robert Caraballo would only be known by the nickname given in that case of Jack in the Box. And the murder case went cold. Well, the crime scene was covered with blood at the bottom of those stairs. And there were also other air, inner air artifacts like the damage to the, uh, the uh, post. And the floor was partially cement and dirt. So McMillan testified in court that he helped Beverly and her daughter paint those banisters and pour more cement on that cement floor, hiding all of the blood that was there. Beverly sold the possessions, and over time, the family moved away. The house fell into disrepair, and eventually, I think at the time they served search warrants to look for the blood, uh, became in a, uninhabitable. Well, the years passed, and huge breaks later came in the case, and I, I hope you'll go down this rabbit hole and learn a whole lot more about it. The shortened version is that this surprise witness came forward, and broke the case wide open. In fact, I spoke to Julie Grant about it on Court TV. Let's listen to that. Uh, Commander, what's it like? What's it like when you you know you're investigating a case, and no answers for so many years, and then all of a sudden you get a communication out of the blue. First, it's email, then it progresses to a phone call. Now it's going to be an interview with somebody who could crack the case. I love the way you say that it progresses to the point that you're ready to do an interview because these things are so challenging. You're, you're right, after so many years, you still receive tidbits of information from people that in, you find out really have nothing to do with the case, but they, they want to, they, they had a dream about it or something else. And so you're, you're trying to constantly triage the information that you're receiving. And you can almost see as this detective goes through his testimony that he's triaging even once he starts saying, hey, I think this one might be really worthwhile and might be worth following up a little further on. And, you, you know, you have to follow up on everything, but there's only so much time in a day. So if this detective was, was bright enough to recognize that there was real meat on the bone here when she starts providing information. And how do you discount the fact that someone says, I was there, I'm a family member, and I was a participant. And so those things become incredibly compelling too. But this is really kind of exciting for me to watch this unfold because it's a piece of an investigation that many of us out in the public never get to hear about or see. Right, right, Mike. You know, and what's it like? I, I really appreciate the job that uh, you do in law enforcement, uh, all of the men and women who serve our, our great country. I, I can never do what you do. And when you think about how you don't want to spook somebody like this who may be coming forward but who might any second just clam up and say i'm not going to tell you the whole story how do you kind of walk that line of, of trying to elicit the information but also you know trying to make sure that um they know they can can trust you for lack of a better way of saying it yeah i think you, you have to assess kind of where they are emotionally and uh where they are in the whole criminal justice scenario because they, they might be impeaching themselves by some of the testimony that they give. And so you want to be able to kind of coalesce and take that information in at a slow rate. But usually when people hit this point, especially if it's been 20 years, uh, 17 years, you're finally getting the courage and you're seeing people that have gotten the courage to now stand up and say, hey, I don't have to be quiet about this. I don't have to sit back. And, and even in this individual's case where they may have responsibilities for pieces and parts that that they're ready to say I don't care what happens I've got to clear my conscience and that's an incredibly powerful witness to have on your side is someone who says you know what even if I'm stepping out onto thin ice myself I have to make things right 
Mike, I love how you said that, because it seems to me that's exactly what happened with this woman. It sounds like she just needed to get this off her chest, clear her conscience, tell the police what she knows, and in doing so, got her mom in a whole lot of trouble, as we know. Oh, uh, Commander King, I'm so glad we have you on the show this morning. So with the mystery solved of who the jack-in-the-box man is, and the other two convictions were firmly in place, it seems like today when we watch Beverly McCollum going through this murder trial that she's got an awfully tall mountain to climb here. She's going to have a tough time convincing a jury that she didn't mastermind Caraballo's murder. Because remember, in earlier testimony of the case, um, McMillan talks about it, talks about her setting it up. And now, as we listen to the new testimony that's coming out, the idea around how they identified who Caraballo was centered around this idea of forensic odonology. Now, remember, Caraballo's body had been burned beyond recognition, so the investigators had to rely on these odontologists, forensic dental examiners, to look at the teeth, examine them, compare them with known dental records and try to establish who this individual's identity was, or at least how old that he was. As they looked at the tooth morphology, that's the study of the shape and the form of the teeth, uh, as they looked at the bite or the dental restoration work that had been done, cavities that had been filled, they could compare that against other dental records of known people who are missing and be able to come back with comparisons and hopefully with matches. As you think about the comparison of the teeth, keep in mind that teeth are usually not subject to environmental and nutritional factors. So they're going to survive much longer than other kinds of forensic tissue and bone that law enforcement would need to examine. Let's watch this. Uh, you're, you're such a perfect person to talk to about these case, uh, this case. You're uh, someone who has a lot of experience with cold cases and uh, working investigations for many, many years. Uh, tell me what you're seeing. I'm curious what comes uh, to your mind as interesting, fascinating, or questionable, Mike, as you look at the facts of this jack-in-the-box case. Well, I think the prosecution is doing a great job of laying it out. I love the opening statement from the prosecutor where he laid out the fact that, hey, we really don't know the exact day that this happened, but here are all the things that are telling us these individuals were responsible for this particular death. But right now with this witness, I'm really enjoying hearing this really seasoned and now retired detective talk about this experience. And you can see these impact law enforcement officers they never give up on wanting these cases solved. But now as they're talking about the dental forensics, Julie, I, I think it's so important to just kind of understand that dental forensics are an incredibly powerful fingerprint when they're trying to identify a, a body that's been discovered somewhere because the teeth won't decay like the body will. And so it really gives law enforcement this chance to go back in time find historic records, especially if the person actually visits a dentist from time to time, and start to put together things like age or the condition of the teeth when the, this happened. Were the teeth involved in some of the blunt trauma that was experienced in this particular case? All of this evidence is really important, and what they're going through right now is laying a very powerful foundation that, yes, in fact, this is the same individual that was murdered, this individual is tied to the defendant and the story that's coming out from other participants in this crime are going to be really compelling. Right. You're right, Mike. That's that's part of, I think, a problem for her defense. Well, I hope that you found this case to be interesting and that it might just be the next case that you go down the rabbit hole after. And if you do go down the rabbit hole, enjoy the journey. And make sure to catch me on Court TV for all the trial activity on this one. In fact, I'm going to be on a couple more times this week. So I hope that we get a link up there. And I'll be looking for your comments down below as to how this case has impacted you as you've learned more about it. Now, don't forget that I've created a special discount code for any of you that are out there thinking about attending CrimeCon in Nashville. 
It'll be at the end of May. And I'll tell you what, if you haven't been to a crime con, it is really quite an experience. And you're going to see all kinds of creators there and some of the big names in, in television and uh, in, in managing these kinds of cases. So make sure you're checking for the discount code down below and use that code. And let's look for a time to sit down together in Nashville at CrimeCon. We'll get the whole Profiling Evil family together. Remember that you can find Profiling Evil on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And make sure that you're checking out our Profiling Evil audio podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. You know, you can catch me live this Thursday night on Profiling Evil as we dig into the baby cemetery in the FLDS polygamous community. We're going to be doing it at 8 p.m. Mountain Time, maybe 7 p.m. I haven't quite decided yet. But I've got something really special that I'm going to share with you. And it's been 75 years in the making. Don't forget to tune in for that on Thursday night. And don't forget about choir practice. Hey, everybody. Look who I'm hanging out with. And uh, listen, I'm not attending choir practice, but I just wanted to tell you that you need to be watching Profiling Evil YouTube. Don't miss it. I'm telling you, there's something there for you every single time. I never miss. You shouldn't either. I got a special guest coming on, David Robinson, the father of Daniel Robinson, that young man who's been missing down in Arizona for a couple of years now. Mr. Robinson is amazing, and he's got some special news to share, and he'll be sharing it on uh, Monday night on choir practice. Now, I don't want you to get too wrapped around the axles on this. They haven't found Daniel yet, but this is a special uh, announcement, and you're not going to want to miss it. So thanks so much for your support of Profiling Evil, folks, and we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.